Um, first of all, thanks to Google and Astrails, which I will uh, talk about uh, about a few minutes uh, from now. Um, for the uh, video sponsorship, uh, thank you, D uh, David, Gab, <laughs> and uh, Ethan Levit, who will uh, come and speak uh, for the second le lecture. Um, about the group, uh, so our goals are um, basically increased motivation to entrepreneurs. We're all like we're all dealing with the, dealing with the same problems. And we want to uh, make it faster and uh, reduce our waste and uh, uh, the waste of time and money that we invest in uh, building uh, our uh, new uh, idea. So uh, this uh, group was founded uh, to, to share the knowledge and uh, share real stories from people and not just the theory we all hear about. Um, if you want to share uh, your story, and you, you think you have an inter interesting story or lessons to, to share to the community, you're welcome to contact me. And if you, are, uh, if you have or know a company that would like to uh, sponsor the, the video for this uh, meetup, it all go, goes back to the community as you see. So we'll have the video to look back or for people that uh, didn't have the chance to come. Today, so they will uh, uh, can, uh, they will uh, be able to see uh, the lectures. So, uh, if you know anyone who want to sponsor or contri contribute to this group, please contact me. This is my email. My name is Shai Resnik. And uh, so, uh, for all, all of you that uh, uh, didn't have the chance to play uh, the the meeting game we <laughs> we play every time, so. Please uh, turn to the guy or girl on your left and introduce yourself, then your name and your startup. What is it, is it about? So uh, I would appreciate it uh, if you like to share uh, pictures on uh, Meetup, Facebook, Twitter. And... Uh, if uh, we can continue, uh, let's um, let's uh, welcome uh, David Goldenberg. Who will share uh, the, his first uh, lessons. Uh, meanwhile, while he speaks, I will uh, uh, talk about a uh, little bit about um, uh, Astrails. So Astrails uh, are the company uh, who sponsor our videos. Uh, for uh, they uh, came to us and offered to contribute to the community and uh, sponsor three meetups. Basically, there, if you need a, a tech company, uh, you don't have a tech co-founder, or uh, you want to uh, build your uh, uh, your MVP fast, uh, this is the company for you. They're really, really into uh, lean software development. They do just what you need and not, not extra stuff that you don't really need and <coughs> will cost you uh, more money. And uh, they are per personal friends, so I, I talk from experience. Uh, so if you need, uh, you need them, astrails.com, um, they're the company for you. So without further ado. Shalom, hi. My name is uh, David Gabriel, and I'm here to talk to you about finding a problem that you can solve, right? Because if you're just going to create a technology and then hope afterwards to find a market for it, chances are you're going to waste. And obviously, like Shai just said, the whole point of Lean is not to waste. So I'm here basically on my own behalf, although I'm in my employer's uh, sweater. And I've been working for most of the past year, year and a half, on making a better Jewish matchmaking service called Good People Dating. And I would really love your feedback, you know, either by Twitter, by email, and essentially tell me, you know, what I did well, what I could do better. I would really be appreciative of that. I'll just use this for now. Thank you, Lesha. 
So just so that we're all really quickly on the same page, there's two big aspects to how Lean works, right? So the first one is doing your market research properly, meaning ensuring that you're solving a real problem, like I said. And the other aspect, right, is to offer a desirable product. So you're going to do later on solution interviews to talk with people and see what do they think of this idea, that idea, right, to make sure you're offering the right solution, not just that you found a problem, but the solution is not shayechet, is not relevant. One great example that we have from the real world of how this can work excellently is franchises. So I'm sure most of you have heard that small businesses, startups usually have an 80 or 90% failure rate, but franchises have a 75% success rate, which is remarkable. It's olam And the reason for that is that essentially they've built a system of a finding the right problem, right, for the right market and the solution that matches it. And of course, m systems to produce and measure the product all the way through. So I'm not going to talk about the whole process. That would be too long of a presentation. I'm just talking about the first half, right? Which is, how do you find a problem? And for the most part, I'm going to be talking about my own experiences doing this for good people dating. Sorry. OK. So there are five different aspects in particular I'd like to talk about. The first one is why not use other alternatives to lean research methods, right? So the lean method is really focused on problem interviews. But you must have heard of other tactics, for example, surveys, right? Or buying data from brokers. Why not use one of those? Also talk about the right mindset you need to have in order to do lean properly. Because as entrepreneurs, usually we have this great idea we're so excited about but the market doesn't necessarily know that that's such a great idea. And even when you talk about it with them, it's not such a great thing. So there's a particular mindset that'll help you be more successful, a different attitude. We'll address that. And then what is it that you're trying to learn? What are you trying to figure out with this approach, with this lean research, OK? So the tools for that are interviews and surveys. And we'll see how they fit. And then finally, as a little bit of a bonus, I'll talk about a particular way to use crowdsourcing, right? You probably heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk, other websites, in order to make your research go faster and make it cheaper as well. So there are a few different inferior alternatives to lean research, and mostly they have to do with ways that you could start out on the wrong foot. So the first one, I know from experience, is don't have any plan, who cares? You know, and I did a uh, commerce diploma at this place called Dawson College. I learned a lot. But unfortunately, most people are not entrepreneurs. And so they don't know to teach entrepreneurship. So they taught us like all these expensive, implausible ways that an entrepreneur doesn't have the means for, doesn't have the time for. How could you possibly do these things? So I was like, OK, well, these ideas are ridiculous. Obviously, nobody else is doing them, because I spoke to other friends. And I thought, OK, so I'll just wing it. So after about six or seven years, Baruch Hashem, I did end up selling the uh, company. But obviously for a lot less than if I'd planned, right, and had an approach that I was following, a game plan as it were, rather than just being random and trying to wing it. <laughs> OK. The second tactic I'm sure you've heard of is phone surveys or online surveys, right? So for example, when there's an election, we hear about this party has 53%, that one has 32%, etc. So essentially, they have people calling in the phone book at random. And the idea is to get a representative survey of the population. Now this assumes a few things. First of all, it assumes that a random survey of the population is a good thing. And it's not, because your market is not everybody. Your market is a specific segment of the population. Another assumption is that you have all this money, right? This starts at least at 2,000, usually more, right? If you're just starting up and you're trying to be lean, that's a lot of money, especially when another assumption, they think you know what the right questions are. And this ties into the attitude we'll talk about later. You don't really know the right questions to ask usually when you're starting out. Another one is data brokers, especially for people who want to do enterprise, want to do B2B. So there are companies like Dun & Bradstreet which will sell you information such as who are the executives, what is their contact information, you know, what, are, what other software or things are they buying, what's the buying cycle like there. 
Again, it's assuming you have lots of money, you know what questions to ask, what data to buy, etc. This is wasteful because usually when you're starting out, you don't know anything and you have to take that assumption as your basis. Brainstorming, right? So brainstorming has a place. But when it's your whole process, right, and it's not the starting point for research, but it's I'm just going to brainstorm, then essentially you're playing the lottery and you're hoping that you have a guess which is lucky. Sometimes you might be lucky, but sometimes you won't be. And that's an easy way to fail as well as to waste time. But more importantly, okay, even if you fail, you can't optimize, you can't improve because there's no way to measure this. Right? If you're just guessing, how do I know if I'm right or wrong? Like, unless I go to the market and I do all this research afterwards to find out, I don't know. So pre-selling, you guys maybe heard of Seth Godin and his book Meatball Sunday, or Tim Ferriss' book The 4-Hour Workweek, and they talk a lot about pre-selling. And it's important, and it has a place in the research cycle, but it's not the starting point. And in Meatball Sunday, he talks about the toy industry. So it's, it's really fun how they do this. They get together, everybody, right? all the buyers, the sellers, whatever, the people who want to produce toys, to, at this big conference in February, right? And what do they do? They sit there watching commercials, watching TV ads. And the ads with the most selling appeal determine what products end up getting made for Christmas of that year. So this is useful if you're already quite far down, you understand who the audience is, you understand what need you're solving for them, and usually this is more for like an iterative approach, right? We're making a better remote controlled car, we're making a better Barbie doll, whatever. But if you start out with this, right? So before we said you're guessing, and here you're guess and checking, so great, you know, you're measuring, you can tell whether or not you got sales, so this should be a lot better, right? I can tell you from my personal experience, I, I wrote the first book on advanced SEO. And I you know, got names and emails for my list, and I pre-sold the book, so I was able to tell you, know, is, is there actually any tactless interest? Are people giving me money or not? But the, the problem with this is that you're just guessing. You're like little children right, who play hot and cold. I don't know if you know this game. Like there's one person leaves the room, you choose right, a treasure item, and the person walks around, they're like, colder, 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 hotter, 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 right? And they're trying to figure out what the item is based on the audience's feedback. But there's no chav in it, right? There's, there's no like, ways telling you, okay, 500 meters straight, and then to the right left, and you're good, you found it. This is just approximating. And again, when you're approximating, you're wasting time. Another popular substitute is with VCs, right? They're like, oh, this guy's got experience. He was really successful. Last time he exited for a billion dollars, he must know what he's doing. So I've had no exit for a billion dollars. But other people who have, right, you may have heard of Color, I think, uh, recently basically just failed um, very publicly. And this is a guy who you know, knows what he's doing. He made a lot of money his first time around, or second time, whatever it was. Raised all this money, and then it was a blowout. I can speak from my personal experience. ILB is a uh, WordPress plugin I created. I promoted it, got you know, 25,000 downloads. Not bad, right? For Rookie, I was about two years into internet marketing. And you know, links from basically all the top sites, people I didn't even know in Russia, in Romania, Brazil, Japan, all over the world, literally. So you think, OK, yeah, let's give Gab more money. He'll make another WordPress plugin. This is like a sure thing. Guess what? I did another plugin. Got a handful of links, a handful of downloads. I'm not uh, bragging about this one. So what are some of the common problems between all these different issues? So one of them, obviously, is cost. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your motivation, right? Like Shai brought up. And we saw so last time with David Katz, if you guys remember his presentation. You know, he was working in the HR field. And he was sort of getting closer. But after a year, he gave up. And they, you know, people asked him. And I had this question, too. Why did you give up? It seemed like you were getting closer. You're talking to Mozilla. This is a potentially very big client. He said, Nimasli, you know, fair enough. Like, the guy's been at it for a year. He's not really got any headway. Any headway. Severe. Another problem, this is probably the key one, which underlies all the other ones, is you don't really get insight. You're not learning. Okay? If, if you guys have read the book Running Lean by Ash Mariah, I, I really encourage you to, you'll see that the key thing he wants to bring up is that you need to learn Right? Because by learning, you can iterate closer to a plan that works. 
So Febreze is an interesting case study. If you guys don't know what it is, it's basically a, a little um, chemical spray that you put on your clothes or other materials and it removes the stench, right? So they thought, great, smokers smell really bad. And so we give them this and they'll be like, fantastic, you know? And, and since they keep on smoking, right, because they're addicted, well, they're going to keep on using Febreze. We can't, we can't fail. It's logical. It's a guess. But it failed. Their sales really sucked out of the gate. And this is a huge company. This is, I think, a Procter & Gamble product or something. This is a multi-billion dollar company. So then they did the research, okay, and they're like, okay, well, who is buying this? How are they using it? And they went to people's homes, and they filmed the women who are using this. And they found people were, let's say, cleaning the den, cleaning the bedroom, whatever. And when they were done, they were doing like, spritz, spritz, finish the den, okay. Bedroom, done, spritz, spritz. Okay, it's like their own little reward, right? You've had a, a to-do list and you check things off, it feels really good. Same idea. So then they changed their ads around and they, and they showed people cleaning their homes and spritzing as a sort of self-reward and sales took off. Okay, but if they'd done this research in the first place, how much angst and pain would it have saved for them? Another issue I, I sort of refer to is with my book. So I, I had all this data about emails and sales and you know very quickly I'm, I'm a very conversion oriented guy right uh, conversions just means sales and internet marketing slang and I'm like okay so how do I make the site more user friendly how do I make the copy more persuasive all this stuff right I'm split testing I'm doing usability tests but what you get is this focus on scaling how do I make this bigger how do I get more people on my email list how do I get more sales but you're not focused on understanding your client. You don't know what they care about. And if you don't know what they care about, you can't offer it to them. So this is, a, I think, a common problem. And, and it's so tricky because you've got money. You've got traction. And you know, if, if you read it all, especially for this entrepreneurship crowd, if you're reading about angels and VCs basically raising money, we want traction. Tell us about your users. Tell us about how much money you're making. I've got traction. What more do you want? You know? But if you've got traction without understanding, you're going to re reach what they call a local maximum, right? So imagine a mountain range, and right. So traction, you're you're making progress. You're like a third of the way up the hill. Very nice. And then what happens is that okay, so you optimize, you do everything, you reach the peak, and you're like, yeah, I'm the champion. And then you look over and you're like, oh, well, that mountain was so much more massive. If only I'd done my research, I would have known that, and my market would have been ten times bigger. And all this work and effort would have paid off a lot better. So in summary, what are the benefits of Lean as opposed to this? You're going to get real insight. You're really going to understand what the customers need. What is their problem? It's obviously a lot cheaper because you're not wasting this time, this money, etc. your motivation. It's much faster learning, right? You're not, you're not guessing, checking. You're not trying to feel your way around trying to approximate what the solution is. You're actually learning and starting out, right? If, if you guys have any internet marketing background, when you understand the problem, you can be like, hey, is your you know, baby carriage really low and you're bending over walking around like this the whole time? We've got the solution for you. If you understand that that's really the problem and your conversions start much higher so that the scaling actually isn't a problem even though you've had a delay because you start out with a higher conversion rate. Another point is that this doesn't assume anything. It assumes you know nothing, which is the truth. When you're starting out, you don't know your market. So that was the first part of five, right? We said we're going to start with poor alternatives to lean and why lean is a better solution. Now, let's talk just about the mindset. So right now I'm doing good people dating and I thought, you know, how can I be different from all the dating sites, right? And all these sites have one big problem in common. And that problem is that once you make a match, you've lost your customers. So you can only get limited repeat business, basically if you're doing poorer job for your customers. Don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a very fun business model to me. So I thought, okay, I know. I'm going to serve couples too. So I'm going to do something right, to help them build great relationships and lasting marriages. They'll be really happy. So I thought of an idea. right? I, I took the relationship bank account, if any of you read uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People or Highly Effective Teens. I'm like, if you measure your relationship, right, then 
this will be fantastic and people will be able to improve their relationship based on measuring it. People hated it. They laughed at it. Um, you know, my family laughed at it. And if you can't convince your family that you've got a good product, you're, you've got a real problem. People are telling me like, oh, that's such a fun game. You know, like I, I totally know somebody else who could use it, but not me. So the first thing is, <laughs> and it gets even funnier because after I did all this and wasted all this time, I'm like, oh, that was a bad idea. I've got a better one. Let me try to do all these interviews. And this one is really going to be validated by the interviews. You don't know your market, OK? So we need to be humble and admit this. And instead of asking forward-looking questions in the interviews, would you like this? Does this feature sound like a good idea to you? What do you think about this approach to solving the problem? Ask questions about the past, because that is certain. People either did something or they didn't. They either struggled with something or they didn't, right? And in this way, you're going to get real data, right? And your humility will actually help you to be a big shot afterwards. And then you can boast once you have that billion dollar exit. The other point is that you have to be patient, right? A lot of us, and it's just human nature, like to build. We want to plant a tree and harvest the fruits. And right, we want to write code and get people to use it. But if you do that before you understand who you're writing code for and what you're solving for them, you're wasting and you're more likely to fail. So this is what we need to learn now. What is the problem? Is it a broken swing set or is it a dropped snow cone? And who is my audience? Is it the five-year-old Irish-looking girl or is it the three-year-old Hispanic-looking boy? OK. So in order to do this, we want interviews. If you've read Running Lean, talks a lot about problem interviews. So one thing he doesn't really address is where do you get people to be interviewed from? So I saw a really interesting video on customerdevlabs.com. It's a great blog about running lean, where actually another dating entrepreneur went to Amazon Mechanical Turk, and he crowdsourced loads of interviews. Like in four hours, he got 100 interviews. It blew my mind. I'm like, well, he's in dating. I'm in dating. I need interviews. He's got interviews. Let me go to Ma Mechanical Turk. It was a total blow up. Totally failed. Didn't quite figure out why. But I went to Facebook. And my friends were great. They allowed me to interview them. They passed it on to other people who were willing to be interviewed. I also posted in Facebook groups as opposed to just messaging friends directly. You know, groups that I was a, a part of. I wasn't like spamming random groups. And both of these really got me interviews, got me more data uh, later for surveys, as I'll talk about soon. Another one, he talks about this in the book, and I can vouch for how valuable this is. Always ask at the end of your interview for a referral. Right? So you've got a script. You should be following a script so that your interviews more or less are gathering the same data from each person you speak to. And at the end, you ask, please, can you refer me to two or three other people who should be you know, roughly in this target market? Similar demographics, similar whatever. You know, you know what the target audience is. Now, to get these interviews, right, you have to set a target and work backwards. So if you want five interviews a week, you need to get five of them approved, right? Because approving and scheduling, right, people who are happy to be interviewed don't necessarily have the time. So to get five in, uh, scheduled, you need probably, let's say, 10 or 15 agreed. And to get 10 or 15 agreed, you need to ask maybe 30 or 40 people, let's say. Maybe your friends like you more, or maybe you only need to ask as many. For me, let's say 30 or 40. Another issue, especially for any of you who want to target North America, right? The shuk here, the market here is, let's say, 8 million people there. there it's, uh, is here is 8. There's 350, so probably a lot of us who want a big market want to target there. Guess what? We're seven hours ahead. That's really difficult for scheduling because it means when somebody leaves their job at 5 p.m. in you know, New York, anywhere on the East Coast. I'm from Montreal, Canada. I'm Italia from there. And they're leaving at 5. It's midnight here. So give them just a little time to breathe, get out of the office, you know, let their, let their brain uh, wander a bit. It's 12.20, 12.30, midnight, right? When you just start your interview, you're going to finish at quarter past 1. If you run one back to back, you're going to bed at 2, 2.30. So that's very difficult. And 
what I found is that mostly I was scheduling my interviews on Sundays because people aren't working, so it was able to work out in that way. One solution I found is that the data isn't necessarily different between Israel and the rest of the world. Okay? So I didn't know this in the first place, but I thought, hey, if I can get the data anyways, you know, during my week I obviously wasn't interviewing people in North America because they weren't available. So if I can, you know, let's say on a Tuesday, on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, interview somebody in Israel, well, fantastic, because that's more data, and who knows, maybe it'll be useful somewhere out down the line to let me correlate, let me better understand. Another little trick, GMT, right, stands for Greenwich Mean Time, as opposed to Israel Standard Time, and that's the time that England is on. If you know your geography, England is only two hours behind us. So that makes your scheduling life a heck of a lot easier, plus their culture, not completely the same as North America, obviously there's some distinctions, but it's still an English-speaking country, a lot of Western culture is shared, they watch Hollywood movies, etc. Another idea, okay, so up to here is experience, the next bullet point is theory, so take it maybe with a grain of salt. You can perhaps hire a foreign virtual assistant to actually do the interviews for you, so you can't be interviewing the people, but maybe you can hire somebody locally over there who is in the right time zone that'll be convenient for your audience and for them. Now, why didn't I do this? A few things. First of all, I'm a perfectionist. I like things to be done really, really well. And I'm reluctant to trust a stranger when it's so hard in the first place to get these interviews. You know, if they screw it up, it's with a friend. Eh. And another thing is, I'm really passionate. I care about this. I want to help Jewish singles get married. And I didn't know if people who are just being paid basically by the hour would, you know, ask the follow-up questions and show the interest and, and the, you know, ozen, ozen shumat, the, the listening ear that I would show to my interviewees. So, you know, some pros and cons. If you uh, test it out, I'd love to hear what your experience was like with that. So, now, once you know what you're looking for, right, what the problems are and who the audience is, you need to get in your customer's mind. And the way to do this is to ask, what is the biggest problem preventing you from achieving your goal? Yep? Well, that's a, a bit strange question because uh, you have a product in mind that solves, uh, to your opinion, one or two problems. And when you ask generally what kind of problem do you have, it might, you might get an answer that, uh, that uh, it's not relevant to your product at all. So the full question is, what is the biggest problem preventing you from achieving your goal? And so you substitute out preventing you from achieving your goal for what's relevant to the market. So in my case, I was asking, what's the biggest struggle, what's the biggest challenge preventing you from finding your spouse, right? So now they're not going to start talking to me about how, I don't know, Skype crashes on them. That's obviously not, I mean, maybe if they're talking to, you know, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, whatever, okay, maybe that's a problem, but. How, yeah. how can you rely on, on such an answer? Like the person can have personal problems, especially in this field. Good question. So I'll just repeat it louder. I share everything with you. All. Absolutely. How can you rely on such an answer, especially in dating? It's sensitive. People might be a bit shy. How can you rely on it? So a few things. First of all, you're not relying on any one person's answer. You're looking for the pattern in the data. So maybe one person's going to lie, maybe somebody else is concerned, whatever, but you're going to notice patterns, number one. Number two, provided that you tell people up front, this is private, I'm not out to share this with everybody, right? And these are your friends, so there's some degree of trust, right? Or your friends' friends because you ask for referrals. Then you do get that trust. I can tell you from my experience, I got fantastic data, right? So when you ask this question, when you get into your customers' minds and you're seeing what they're seeing, okay, so it's, it's incredible, right? Like, what happens is just like, it's magical. It's, it's lovely. You get this insight, you figured out what do I need to do? What do I need to help them with? Yeah. 
Question. No, uh, just a small remark. It's very important how do you ask. Yeah. To ask what is the problem, it's not good. Okay, how would you ask it? Because it's negative. Okay. You might cause yourself a problem. Okay. It's better to go in the positive way. Just okay. Just like asking them, how can I help you to achieve, uh, to get a date or to get a, a spouse? Okay. And not to go by the negative. It's once we uh, asking people, we have to put some of our thoughts and mind in the way we are asking them. Because in the way you are going to ask them, you ask them this way or another way, you're going to get a totally different uh, uh, answers. You're right. You're right. So the comment is, if you ask with a sort of negative phrasing, what is the problem, as opposed to how can I help you, then you might get very different answers depending how you phrase the question. So you're right. Now the thing is, we're looking to find out what their problems are, what they're struggling with. If you ask, how can I help you, then people are very solution focused and they tell you, oh, you could do J-Date but better like this or you could do matchmaking better like that, okay? And that might be useful later on to ask, but initially you need to find that out. And I can tell you from my personal experience, it does work. It might be worthwhile to test and see, you know, how can I help you, uh, you know, sort of split test interviews and see if that gets you better data. I suspect though that you would get like, you know, the, the famous quote from I think uh, Henry Ford, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd have told me faster horses, right? So, yeah, the same thing. Like if you're yep. going to date, and you're saying, "I'm a great dater," this is your problem. You're concentrating in dating and not in finding. Okay. Okay. So it's the same thing. Just like you say, you bring me a faster horse. Because now you're thinking with the people, how do I get more dates? Do I really need more dates, or I need to get the right person to find it? This is the, this is the question. So the question is not, how do I help you with the process? How do I help you with the goal? Right? So when you're talking about the goal, I didn't say, how do I help you date better? Right? In which case, that would be a very valid comment. And, and it's easy to see how that nuance could be lost. It's very easy to ask, how can I help you have more fun dates, dates where the conversation is better? Right? Well, if that's the goal, fine, right? If your goal is just to make funner dates for people where the conversation you know, flows more freely, then maybe that would be the question. But here you're talking about what is the goal. In my case, it was what is preventing you finding the right person for you. Okay? So that's not talking about the process. It's talking about the goal. And there's, there's a very important distinction. But it's great you bring that up because you're helping see how, in actuality, Right? We, might, we might have understood the theory in one way, but misapplied it. So thank you for clarifying that point so that we know to say the top problem in reaching your goal as opposed to following this process. So a little tip that you can do is you can have the crowd help you with cross-checking what you found out from interviews. And one amazing site is Quora because people ask questions, right? And people are very, very candid, like almost painfully candid in their answers. I've seen people talking about, you know, being addicted to cigarettes, about being thrown in jail, uh, you know, loads of very personal things. Obesity, this is a very interesting question because it's such a, excuse the pun, large market, right? And, and people say, you know, my problem is not that it's hard to lose weight, it's not that I can't do exercise, it's that they're very sad. And they're eating as comfort. So you can come up with a more clever diet and you can count the calories more intelligently and come up with more tasty foods for them to eat and easier exercises to do. But it's useless because you don't know what the problem is. The problem isn't that it's hard to do exercise, that it's hard for them to count the calories, it's that they're sad, right? So you can read this yourself and you can summarize it yourself, but chances are your time is pretty valuable. So depending on how you value your time, you might consider hiring some people on Amazon Mechanical Turk and just have them go and find these questions, read them and summarize the answers for you. Also, I've mentioned Wiki, StatsBrain, Forums. Basically, you can get similar data 
from Wikipedia and Statsbury in particular, obviously more statistical information, also the US Census, all that information is freely available online. So once you've done these interviews, right, you've done one round of interviews, edit your questions. See, okay, this maybe wasn't so clear. I'm just gonna make sure my phrasing is better. That's to your point. And that I had that experience where I realized I need to, I need to change this around or I need to get rid of this question because it's, it's useless. Now, you do that one or two times, you've got these patterns that are, you're finding. So write a progress report. It's gonna do two things. First of all, for yourself, you're gonna understand better what you've learned where you're going, what are the patterns you're starting to see, who has this problem, what are the main problems, the common problems that my audience has. And then email the progress report, right, because people are giving you your time, it would be very nice if you returned the favor and shared, look, you've helped me learn these things, okay? I'm not gonna tell you all of them are gonna read it. In my case, I'd, I'd say probably most of them ignored it. Maybe I can optimize how I, write, how I wrote it. At least, if you make it shorter, even in the email itself, include a little summary, then it's great because like we said, right, we want to plant a tree and harvest the fruits. So here's a way for the people that got involved and gave you their time to pay them back a little bit. Incidentally, if you are interested in working with me on Jewish matchmaking, I'd be happy to share my progress with you, even if you just want to help out. Question. How many interviews are enough? Great, great question. How many interviews are enough? When do you know to stop? So it's probably going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis. In my case, it probably took more because I thought I had all these great ideas and I was trying to validate my product rather, as opposed to find out what the problems was because I didn't start out being humble. I've done probably about 40 interviews. I wish I'd done more, but as you saw, it was a real pain in the butt. You know, if I had just done three interviews a week, it would have been uh, really great. But your situation might be different. Maybe you realize that Israel versus, let's say, North America is not such a big deal and you have more time, so you can, you can find uh, interviewees much faster. And what I found is that you get the, after 40 interviews, I had a pretty good idea what the common problems were, but I didn't have a ranking. And that's the next point I'm getting to. I've got all these stories, right? Fantastic story. We're still reading it, you know, thousands of years later. But what is the number one problem? The Jews are in exile, that's one problem. She's married to a total drunk who killed his last wife in a fit of rage, that's another problem. The Jews are supposed to be killed in you know, a few weeks, that's another problem. So how do you prioritize which of these problems you are going to address? So you've got qualitative data. Now quantitative data, now is when you want to use surveys, okay? Because with surveys, you can get quantitative data. And I love, love, love Likert scale questions. So that's just fancy research slang to say, rate this problem on a scale of one to five, where one is really hard, five is, sorry, one is really easy, five is really hard, okay? And you've got your problem descriptions there, people click through, ta 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 ta, right? And this is also easier to get people to do because it's just a request for let's say three or four minutes of people's time, as opposed to interviews where 30 minutes, Often 45, 50 minutes is a common situation. And, sorry, what's the question? For the same population you want You can send it to the same population. I personally sent it to other people, but so long as they're roughly in the target audience, right, the reason I didn't send it to the same people is I was concerned that I would have influenced them somehow or by talking about it, I would have guided their choices. So I just wanted people who are sort of completely new to what I'm doing to answer it. But I haven't tested. It might be that just speaking to people who already did the interviews would be you know, a great way to collect the data. Question? You said uh, you're sending it to your target audience. You haven't verified your target audience yet. So maybe all the, the interviews and the questions now are relevant to what you want to do. Excellent point. Maybe your product is not for Jews. You're right. Okay, so the, the comment, the question is, I'm sort of skipping ahead, right? I'm asking people to rate these problems, but I don't know who my audience is. All I did was I asked, what is your biggest problem? And that's just because I made a mistake with a presentation, and I skipped mentioning that in the, dem in the interview stage, you should already be asking demographic questions. And also here, obviously, I'm just focusing on the core of the survey, but elsewhere in the survey, right, for earlier questions, later questions, whenever, 
you also want to ask demographic questions. That's a very good point because that's going to help you understand right, which segment of the audience is which problem. And we'll talk about that in a second. But this right here allows you to average out, I'll get to your question in a second, to average out which is the key problem, right? So problem A may rate 3 out of 5 on average, and problem B is 4 out of 5. Great, now you know to focus on problem B. And I love doing this with WooFoo for two reasons. One, the Likert scale stuff is built in, right? It's just a, a form or survey creation tool. So I don't need to play around with my HTML and go crazy. Saves me time. It's worth it, 15 bucks a month. And you can export to CSV, which is great, because when you export to CSV, then you can get into slicing and dicing the data, and you can compare your demographics, right? Your age, your gender, your location, education, uh, marital status, income, whatever your, your key questions are, to the problem ratings. And you can see, you know, now, sorry, what problem A or B is worse for guys versus girls, let's say. So let's, so we said problem A has an average of 3 out of 5. So that could mean that half the audience, guys, have, you know, 4 out of 5 rating for problem A, but girls only have a 2 out of 5, so it comes out 3 out of 5 rating. And problem B is a fool, right? Women have 5 out of 5 rating, and guys, 3 out of 5. So that, that averages out to 4 out of 5. But if you talk to everybody the same way, right, or if you choose to target the whole audience, men and women, well, one, first of all, you're going to be buying a lot of useless traffic because the guys are definitely not going to convert as well if you're telling them about solving B problem. But also, you can buy all that traffic and convert it better as follows. So you send the women to a landing page that talks about problem B, right? And you send the guys to a landing page that talks about problem A because problem A for them is 4 to 5 as opposed to B, which is 3 to 5. And that is where segmenting the data, like you pointed out, right, by demographics, is very useful. So thank you. I, I'm sorry I skipped talking about that with the interview stage. So you want to ask about the demographics there. And then also with your survey, you know, so that you can not just guess who the right audience is, but have, again, the data to tell you this segment really scores higher on that problem. Question? Yeah, so I read yesterday in Quora that it's actually, in practice, easier to get people to answer your interviews than to answer your uh, Likert scales. Is that really so? I haven't seen the question, so I'm not sure really what the context is, but... Somebody say that he found out the surprising result that people prefer to answer uh, interviews than to do a survey. Right. So I, I haven't... I'll repeat the question. Um, the gentleman here said that he saw in Quora an interesting point that it's easier to get people to answer interview questions than to answer Likert scale questions, which is surprising because it's just, right, yeah, click, 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 should be very easy. I think the context probably of that question is an open-ended question, right, like you would have in an interview. Interviews versus surveys. Interviews over the phone. Yeah. I don't know, I'd have to look at that, but thank you because that might be a really great hack to improve your research, make it go faster. So if you could send me that link, I'd appreciate it. So. We've talked about problems with alternatives to lean research. We've talked about the right attitude to have, right? Being more humble, being more patient. And we've talked about what you need to figure out. What is the problem? Who's the audience? And we've talked about using interviews and surveys to figure that out. So now it's for the like, bonus material. How do you do this faster and cheaper with crowdsourcing? How do you use Mechanical Turk for all this stuff, for example? So, just so everybody knows, Mechanical Turk is just basically a platform where you can hire a bunch of people to do a task that you specify. Right? So you say, I'm going to pay 10 people to do this survey. Each uh, person does a survey, gets a dollar. And you can also specify who does a survey. I'll talk about that in a second. And it's according to academics who've studied this, they've compared census data, da da da. Roughly representative of the US population, which is excellent for us. Because in the US population, there's lots of different people. And you can figure out, who is my segment? Who do I want to talk to? So the problem with Mechanical Turk is you're limited in terms of who you can pick. You don't get to have anybody do your, excuse me, they will let anybody do your survey, which isn't really what we want. We don't want to sell a product to everybody, right? 
unless you're Rami Levy and everybody needs to eat, but most of us are not. So they just like narrow down by country and proficiency. So that means somebody has done 500 tasks and had you know, 450 approved, they've got 90% approval rate. Wonderful, so they're not totally incompetent and they live in the United States. That narrows it down. So how do we narrow things down further to make sure that we get the exact right audience we're looking for, right? In Mechanical Turk slang, the right Turkers, right? Turkers are just Mechanical Turk workers. So here are a few advanced tricks. If you've read the book Predictably Rational by Dan Ariely, he shows you that if you tell people you're on the honor system and I'm trusting you, even if people have an incentive to cheat, a financial incentive, they'll still do the right thing. Even, and this was really comical in the book, he was saying you're on the MIT or whatever the school was honor system. The school had no official honor system, <laughs> right? And still people with no invigilator in the class, with being paid like 10 or 15 cents per correct answer, didn't cheat. So how I write a task when I want specific people to do it is as follows. I say, if you're doing this task, I'm trusting you on the honor system that you are, let's say, a mother with a child under the age of two, right? If I want the baby carriages audience, let's say. And you get mothers with children under the age of two. Another trick is let's say you want to exclude some people from your audience, which would be really useful in the case of surveys, right? So I've found very often that it's not enough to just set a task and forget it. Let's say you want to collect survey data from 100 people. It's not usually the best idea to just say, OK, I'm going to pay $1 to 100 people. Here's a survey, go. Why? Because usually there's a little problem in how you phrase the questions. You need to do some quality assurance, basically. You forgot to ask a question. So instead, you ask 10 people to do it, right? So that you can figure out from their problems, from their mistakes, how do you improve the survey for next time. But what happens is, next time, Mechanical Turk doesn't just let you exclude those 10 people who did the exact same task before. So you had Steve and John and Chaim do your survey, wonderful. But now they're able to do it again just because you added a question. Well, that's not really worth it because I want to pay a dollar to 10 new people so that for that one extra question, I'm going to get also 10 new answers. So the symbol code hack, you send people to a page that says, what's your mechanical Turk ID, right? Proceed. And when they click proceed, you send them to a page with a very simple piece of code, any coder can write this for you. And it says, if Mechanical Turk ID equals the IDs of people who've done this before, don't let them do it. Sorry, Chaim, you did this. If it doesn't equal a Turk ID that we've already collected, please proceed. It's fine, OK? Another trick that Mechanical, sorry, question. If you can do that, can't you use like um, technology from the ad, online ad business to also filter based on other demographics? For example? You know, if you can send them to a page of your own, then you can check using the technology coming If they have third-party cookies and tell you the demographics. Yeah, is email, email yeah. what kind of you know, purchases does it That's mean? a very clever idea, yeah. You probably could do that. The question was, if you can send them to your own page, then maybe you can you know, also check ad-serving cookies to see what are the demographics of these people. And you can get richer data on who your audience is. Good hack. So, Finally, right, you can use qualifications. Normally, Amazon Mechanical Turk asks you to do this for people's abilities, right? So he did his ability test, he did it well, great, he's got his ability testing qualification. But you can also use it for demographics. So how it works is like this. You run a demographic survey, age, gender, income, whatever your questions are, and then you assign qualification for anybody who's got income over X. Who's a guy? Who's a girl? Who, you know, whatever your questions are. And then afterwards, when you have the task that you want people to do, you can just specify, OK, they have to have the 30 plus qualification. They have to have the PhD qualification. So we said this is useful for recruiting survey takers. Another thing it's useful for is analysis, right? So you've gathered this data. Now it's time to slice and dice it, like we said earlier. I can't tell you this is how great of a return on investment this is. It's probably the best ROI I've got. So you export your spreadsheet, okay? you remove the personally identifiable information, and you upload it so that people can access it, download the spreadsheet, and slice and dice it themselves. 
And what you're doing is you pay just a basic amount, let's say five bucks, okay, just to do the task. But you're bonusing, and here's where people can really make money, for finding patterns in the data. What are the relationships, right, between variable X and variable Y, right? So for example, your demographics and your problems. Or you could perhaps find patterns in the demographics, right? So rich men are happier with X or struggle more with Y. And poor men have different problems, let's say. So when you do this, you just learn so much more. And here's a great example. I found out that the struggles Jewish singles have here are not so different. I don't know if you can see the numbers, they're a bit small. But are not so different from the struggles that Jewish singles have in Chutz Laaretz, right? So only problem F uh, has a somewhat interesting difference. But even there, it's not even rated above a three on average, right? Where a five would be you know, a must-have problem to solve. And you look at all these other numbers, it's very, very close margins of difference. So that tells me what? I don't care that I'm seven hours ahead of North America. I can talk to Jewish singles here. What a great productivity advancement. To summarize, right, run your lean research to maximize your odds, to be more like a franchise where you've got 75% chances of success, right, by cutting down your waste, by skipping the poor alternatives, right, like surveys, which would come later in the process, like pre-selling, which comes even later, even after surveys, right? Because your research should start with interviews, with asking your friends, their friends, what is the biggest problem preventing you from achieving your goal? You use your surveys, you write your problems, and of course, if you can use crowdsourcing to go faster, to get more data, Wonderful. So, I'm Gab Goldenberg. I'd love to find a partner to work on this with to make a better Jewish matchmaking service. And if you're interested in the progress report, happy to email it to you. Again, I would really love your feedback. Anything I could do better in this presentation, please tweet me at Gab Goldenberg or write me gab.goldenberg at gmail.com. If you have any more questions, I'm happy to take them now or later. Shai can tell us how much time we have. Few questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the the talk. It was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and I have a question about the um, finding your target audience. Um, do you start out initially with everyone, and then you check which one, which audience is the best, or do you have some target audience in mind? Right. So the so the question is, to find who is your audience, do you start out with everyone? Or do you start out with some idea of who your target audience is? So it's really a question of degrees. You're asking me, I think, what is the nuance? Where's the red line between I'm assuming I know too much or assuming I know too little, right? So if I'm creating a Jewish matchmaking service, chances are it's not so useful to interview non-Jews about their dating experiences. Maybe it's useful, but obviously I'm going to get a better uh, target speaking to Jewish singles. But for age, for example, do you assume weight to 40 or do Oh, great question. For age. Well, this is something you would find out in part by asking demographic questions again in the interviews which our friend raised, right? So I'll tell you, for example, I found, and also if you are familiar at all with the online marketing industry in the dating world, that they will pay a lot less money for a lead who is, let's say, 20 to 25. And the reason is very simple because Singles who are 20 to 25 are often still in college and have a lot of single friends and their single friends have single friends that they can introduce them to. And once you get past this college network, people have fewer single friends, more people are in relationships as they get older and older and there's fewer people they can be introduced to. So you can be informed from your interviews how much you want to do that, how much you want to assume. I guess it depends on your resources and time and money, and also how humble you want to be about it. Thanks. Good question. There's one hack I can share. Please do. My last question, like you, is can you please refer me to other relevant people? My one before last question is always, so what kind of uh, audience do you think matches me best? What kind of people do you think ah. would use my, my product best? And 
Well, since I'm already talking to very diverse people and I'm asking all of them that, I'll get really good answers, eventually. Like somebody will be able to convince me that I was looking at the wrong audience. So the trick was, at the before last question in your interview with somebody, right? just before you ask them for referrals, ask them, hey, who do you think my target audience should be? What are their target demographics, right? Other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.